Um, where's the onslaught? Oh, okay. All right, now I'm being amplified. All right, so welcome to Monday Night Poetry at KGD. Welcome back to the venerable institution in its 28th year, starting in spring 1997. This is season 48. We may have had a slight pandemic keep us away for a little bit, but not very long. Um, it's wonderful to have you all back here. Um, so tonight we have a wonderful um, lineup with Anthony Corelli and Troy Jollimore, and I'm going to launch just right into the reading. Um, I will thank um, the curators. Um, I'm Jason Schneiderman. Um, John Deming is over there working on the um, tech. We, you, you are here, but we are also in the ether. We are also on Zoom. We are, we are virtual and we are present. Um, Dana Gordon, um, our newest curator, um, she may be taking pictures. So if you see her with a camera, smile. Um, and Matt Yeager, our um, curator in absentia, who comes to us virtually from Cincinnati. Okay, Anthony Corelli. Oh yeah, a round of applause for Matt. Yeah. Anthony Corelli. <laughs> All right, Anthony Corelli is a poet of faith. I don't know him well enough to know whether he is a believer or someone without faith, but who is drawn to belief or somewhere in between those two positions. But I know that in his work, he takes faith seriously, using it as a foundation on which the poems are erected. There's something axiomatic about faith. It's a kind of floor, a threshold. And it's not that faith and reason are not caught up in a dance with each other, but rather that faith provides a starting point or an anchor, a rock that offers something permanent when we are flesh and the fate of all flesh is to become dust. I am fallen in the sense that I was a believer who could no longer believe. And I am fallen in the sense that I cannot live up to the ideals that still carry me forward through each day, which is why the poetry of Anthony Corelli is both a comfort and a guide. In embracing the theological, sometimes glancingly, sometimes as a conceit, sometimes straightforwardly, Corelli is able to speak with a confidence that is often lacking in our complicated age, able to capture complex human interactions with a simple parable or a well-told story, touching lightly on what it is that needs to be revealed. In Corelli's work, I find that grace is not a state of being, but rather an engine, a motor that drives us fallen humans forward a quality that explains why we continue even when it seems so much easier to stop. Anthony Corelli was raised in Poinette, Wisconsin. His poems have appeared in various magazines, including The New Yorker, Columbia, and Commonweal, and on various websites, including ParisReview.org, Ani Online, and Memorius. His first book, Carnations, was a finalist for the 2011 Levis Reading Prize. His second book, which he has copies of with him, The New World, Infinitesimal Epics, um, is out just now. He is a recipient of a Hotter Fellowship and the Writing Writers Award. This microphone is about to fall over. And he currently lives in Brooklyn and teaches at New York University. Please welcome Anthony Corelli. Thank you. Can you help me with this mic? Yeah, I've done something to, to I think it's okay. You've angered the mic gods? Yeah, I have angered the mic gods. See, see, if, that, see if that stays. I think this stays. Thank you, Jason. I could read my introduction again. Thank you all for coming. Um, can you hear me all right? Mic check, mic check. My, my. My. My little Columbus adrift at sea in utero. You're already reaching for worlds to come. Please land gently and listen and listen and listen and stay. That's an, an excerpt from the first poem, the, the proem, the preamble of this book. That's titled The New World. And uh, secondarily, the poems are addressed to uh, Columbus <laughs> uh, as you wash ashore. 
uh, in these poems, but primarily, at least this poem, but the most of the poems in the book, speak to an unborn boy who the um, ultrasound technician has just announced um, not just that he's there, but that he can hear our voices. My, my little Columbus, adrift at sea in utero, you're already reaching for worlds to come. Tracing the screen, more ink blot than portrait, we draw what is from what is shadow. Lima bean, hawk beak, bow sprit, it's you. Fearing to face what booms across your Indian Ocean. A disenstoried man on disenstoried land, shouldn't I open with some cute synecdoche, more peaceable, less maniacal? The spirit invoked homes to only gilded horizons. Couldn't I, shouldn't I soft? in what I shake by shifting sounds. Who would dare? Pilgrim, distant listener, be it me or be it thunder, you hear beasts of unknown order. Savage to you, I hesitate in this thicketed wood. I step out to meet you the sound on the shore for which you are bound. Please land gently and listen and listen and listen and stay. Now, oh, thank you. Mm, thank you. Um, now, what uh, do we give the little one to listen to? <laughs> Um, what do we give them to listen to in a time of dissolution? Um, what stories do we tell? The poems in the book are, are such stories. And um, the first one's a bit odd. So the first one after that proem is a bit odd, but, but here we go. Dante jokes in Pestigo. Seen. The Dark Wood. Our two heroes, voluntary exiles, having all are already having second thoughts. What do we do out here? I mean, for fun. Our first night away at a cottage near the Peshtigo River. We sit on the screen porch after dinner, watching the woods get darker. It's the gloaming, I say. That's what we call this in literature. The sun is dead, but not yet fallen. As soon as my words take flight, I see them clap, flop, and fall. So do you. Hmm, you sweet back. That's not altogether unexciting poet. Your chuckle size loops, de loops, and disappears. A great quip comes to mind. Yeah, well, wasn't it Dante in Venice in 1321 who said it can take a man a day or two to settle into his vacation? <laughs> I await your appreciative gasp. <laughs> you know, because he'd been banished from Florence for 20 years then, so crickets. The dark of the wood is settling now like tarnish on gold. Like an aging of the lower light spraying through the old growth, mostly white pine on the today. The midriffs of their trunks, what all can be seen from the forest floor to the roots edge are blushing, then plum purple, now turning brown between buckles of twilight. The glowing you say to me. And so there comes and goes a moment when the air's bright ochre rises in brief, be warmer hues, 
scooping its robes across the grassy saucer of a clearing and through the porch screens of the treadmill, the only cottage for what must be miles around. Another titter, and our infinitesimal epic has up and flown away. Oh God, aren't you starving? We both say starving, just like that. It's a prehistoric hunger joke we reprised after dinner, after we nibbled our seven butter crackers and nibbled blades squares of strange cheddar and nibbled our ears, one each of pale kernel sweet corn. It's all we packed to eat, not enough, but we found such failings funny. Really love this is a perfect dinner. Yeah, perfect for a mouse starving to death in winter. It's a strange humor, ours, we don't think. This unfunny humor who, though we mind it no longer, goes echoing out there somewhere, echoing darker. Where? To whom? There must be whole worlds elsewhere for the unthought thoughts that have flown. Like, shouldn't a story so humble have ended already? Deep twilight now, the birds begin to speak, sweet singing in the bellies of trees, voices in shadows, and a few last lit leaves, all a bit troubled, or so it seems. Coo, coo, chickadee, hee hee, so bad. Coo, coo, kill will, chickadee, coo. I tell you, though, my better listener, at the beck of the call in the song of these shadows who sing their own names, what flashes to my mind is fire. Fire that I learned so little about from the single laminated page left squared to the corners of the kitchen counter. So welcome, weekend guest, thus. Catch to go, Rose, Getaway, Rental, and Deer Hunting Lodge. Emergency numbers, local attractions, and the Peshtigo fire. In these woods, the paragraph begins. October 8, 1871, 1,500 people, 2,500 people, cold front, strong winds, fire, quarrel, because of drought, like a crematorium, mile high flame, Peshtigo paradigm, studied by the American and British legacy, the firebombing of Dresden, such incendiary devices, the firebombing of Tokyo, conditions absolutely perfect. Well, that's a bit far-fetched. The Peshtigo paradigm? Helpful. Some bored Peshtigoan must be dying for attention. I said this all to no one in the kitchen back then. But you, better listener, won't you hear how these lines, as if spoken by shadow, come echoing back to me now? Won't you hear in these lines that fail me a cruelty? My cruelty, I, who am not altogether non-native to this place. Still, I lift these lesser lines to you. When was it, love? On this first night away from our stories in the city, when did we slip beyond hunger? For one does slip beyond hunger. And down to what rung slips the unhungry soul. We don't think these thoughts either. As now, shh, it's a slip of will in this part. And as dark sprawls in around us, as the lantern light, our inside light now thickens on the screens, screening off any glimpse of the woods, we hear far off at first then closer coming, then brushing by, not that bird whose name you called, but the exile and his underworld guide, 
the pilgrim whose seminal song encircles us all in our own unheard conversations. This bewildered question banks in the pitch, pumps its wings once, and glides back now to have its answer. Here, a hoot among shadows many ears, this one word song, the comedians, who, who were you once? Who are you now? Who, who, who? The book is subtitled Infinitesimal Epics. The New World Infinitesimal Epics, which I suppose would be a hero's journey, uh, the story of great magnitude uh, to be sung through the ages, but one that, um, I guess, one whose action rises and falls in a single instant. <laughs> um, and uh, back to that question, what, what song do we sing for the, for the little one? I don't have time to, in, in, in our night here tonight, to, to sing all of these songs. There's a, there's a kind of, of movement into dissolution at the beginning of the book that then comes out in, into um, nothing like solution, but maybe something like imagining uh, um, Pudding or generosity or a new way to sing a song. Um, this next poem is definitely still in the, the dissolution stage. So please land gently <laughs> and listen and listen and listen and stay. The buck. It all happened so quickly. I'm afraid there isn't much to tell. I was back in Wisconsin visiting my parents, both retired already, both healthy at the time. One evening before dinner, I went for a jog, my usual jog on the pine woods loop behind the sewage plant, not far from their house. And there was the buck. Now, oh, was it hot that summer? wet heat, really miserable. Even Mr. McCarthy, our most denying neighbor, allowed that, well, things really do seem warmer than, warmer than ever this summer. This was some days later, when he just thought to drop by and just happened, he said, to bring a bundle of his teriyaki venison jerky, <laughs> truly the world's best, a get well gift for me. But here I wander ahead of myself, I had just crossed the marsh on the bouncy wood bridge. I'd come sailing through those waves of mosquitoes. There must be 10,000. They seem to always be there flying, flying to nowhere, more mosquitoes than air. And then up the marsh bank, where the trail is loose sand and your feet slip back and I stopped. A white-tailed deer, a tremendous buck, 10 points, 12 maybe, his flank walled off the way, 10 yards between us. His rump was set toward me, his shoulders angled away. A rather nonchalant pose I might have sensed if not for the snapped up white of his tail, the deep still lake of his stare, the spiked ears, the antlers. He took me in, but went right on chewing, or concerned I'd gathered about the leaf he'd plucked from the bright shoots dallied on the edge of the trail and about the sound I'd been or the man I'd become. Then the muscles flickered, if such can be seen. The lines of the buck had darkened, retraced just once in pencil, 
in the low gold sunlight. How lovely running makes the evening feel. Moments ago, this is what I'd been thinking. This is some other empty line, maybe the air as cool as skin. So as it swishes past, I feel the arms and thighs of something unfeeling, ever gentle, some being unbodied and everywhere. Wow. Later, after the buck, I recall what there was to recall. That I looked at the eyes, only the eyes. I feel heart late, water, onyx, and that the buck knew only to look back at me. What did he see? When I fled through the grasses and back along the bouncy bridge, I ran with the buck size like faint imperfections on every last frame of the film of my mind. And so through those eyes, or beyond them rather, behind their black blots, I see what I can. It happened so quickly. The snow belly flashed as the buck reared up, the fore groin stretched as the front hooves struck painless quick punches, my wrist and my shoulder, my cheek and my spine. No, no, hey, no, no, I recall calling out. I looked at the buck size, but saw only through. And the tips of three antlers slipped into my skin, slid painless in triceps, hamstring and back, meat, bone, drumming bone, pain. No pain at all. I was well past the bridge then, and back along the road. And what came next came clearer than whatever had come. I was home again, yet running still toward home. I was back on the sandy path I'd spooked from the tree there whose cover I'd sought, and who never cried out as the last of the hoof punches pummeled a rhythmic. For a time I was walking in the blood all sweat in the slick down my flank. My shorts were soaked, I'd be just fine. My mother was bowing like a birch tree, bowing down toward me, bone eyed but not crying. The buck bounded off then as any deer ought to into the woods, still there the milk brown body smaller than, then gone, gone, but still still flashing, the tail still white, white, a heatless light, the pail of ashes shadowing snow. For who knows how long then I lived with this on the kitchen floor. The volunteer ambulance was running late. I was queasy, dizzy, funny. The world was spinning as we say, literally, but hasn't it always been spinning? Some days later, my mother recalls for me how calm I'd been, how composed, how carefully I told her the story, yet how inconsolably I babbled on and on and on, on details that seemed insignificant to her. The fate of the new kitchen tile, for one, my good mother's kitchen floor. It was catching the worst of my blackening blood. The tile was brand new and pure white to boot and no shoes for a white as pure as light on the truth of the matter at hand. This light unimaginably white and indescribably cold. Mm. I truly did not look at my watch. And then this is like, do you know what time we started? 7.30. Okay. Um, I'll read uh, one more poem that begins the second section of the book. And this will be the last poem. The New World. It's true, pilgrims, for you 
It may be that nothing happens anymore. That life is this, going on all around you all the time and nothing else. That this land is blank land. This land is blank land. From California to the unnamed island. That from an Apollo staircase, you may leap each morning a moonwalker to discover the plains of Kansas at last devoid of evil men. And hallelujah now, the cavalry may ride at your command, crusading backward through men, your sword blades true, all we know now, but couldn't know then. If your war horse's hammering head hits the source, that who, you rightly ask, who are the savages now? And true it may be that the whole of your light shines forth in this darkening sky. The heaven between the dot that ends this sentence and the great cross heralding the next. That the infinitesimal is your new glory. And that indeed there is glory in a certain kind of small. That in the long night within your bones there hangs the shard of a crescent moon. And we awaken every morning in a tome of poems, poems. That the great stars immense burning so faintly printed on a noontime flag reminds us all that it is so. That grace may await you nonetheless, pilgrim. That in this in-between breath, you may find your rightful home in these stories that no one remembers, that without you, no one knows. Thank you all. I don't. I don't usually live behind the curtain during the reading. It's a little creepy, but little I, creepy. I needed to be on hand in case the mic um, fell over. And you all, if there's no word to say, you took all the chairs, uh, which is wonderful. That's what we want you to do. Um, we do have. It is a pure coincidence that I have a giant collection of Soviet kitsch, and Ooh. I run a Soviet kitsch reading series. But um, we do have some Soviet kitsch for our readers as a um, uh, little. There we memorial go. that you can yeah, ask them to so take a look at. Um, all right, we're going to take a five minute break. Um, go to the bar, get some drinks, tip Thank Josephine you. well, and we'll be back in five minutes with um, Tori Jolliver. We're going to get started with our second half. Uh, thank you again for coming to KGB Monday Night Poetry. This is our second one back in action. And for those who don't know, I'll say again, we um, developed a little bit of a cool audience on online during the past year and a half when we had to do it that way. And so we're streaming these now as well. Um, but let's uh, give a nice round of applause for our first reader, Anthony Capelli. And I don't know, I mean, the poems are beautiful and also just your inflection and the way you speak, the whole thing made me realize how much I missed being here and doing this. So that was really great. Um, and our next poet is somebody I've read for a long time and really, really love as well. Um, we're talking, I don't know, if you think in the lineage of kind of philosopher, but if you, you know, the poets with the really furrowed brows, um, <laughs> Wallace Stevens, John Cady these days, there's quite a few, but you, you just sort of know what I mean. This is a, this is a, uh, Troy Jollimore is no doubt a thinking person's poet, uh, a lyricist and philosopher capable of living deep inside his own mind, but somehow also deep inside others' minds as well. In the background, his ideas and observations seem guided by a kind of interest in epistemology. And we see in his poems how humans in their minds kind of bat around like moths, how they think and rethink constantly. His understanding of the human drive to make meaning out of things becomes its own kind of meaning making. And yet his poems are also full of humor, surprise, and wit. An abiding empathy in his poems seems to understand the real human problem that we are invested with the will to change things that we can't possibly change. We try to find ways around that problem all the time. Um, you know, that everyone suffers from some measure of confusion mixed with idealism as they wade through their days. The voice in his poems, though, is never maudlin. It's interested, curious, and sincere. 
it suffers and it's trying and it's trying to hear you and trying to hear the voices that speak through it. Um, it hasn't given up hope. Add to this his pristine and surprising images and metaphors that kind of always catch you off guard. And you have really one of the kind of, I think, principal sort of philosopher poet types of his whole generation. Troy is the author of four books of poetry and three books of philosophy, as well as numerous articles, essays, and reviews. His first collection of poetry, Tom Thompson and Purgatory, won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry in 2008. His third, Syllabus of Errors, appeared on the New York Times list of the best books of poetry published in 2015. His poems have been in The New Yorker, Poetry, McSweeney's, New England Review, Tin House, you know, you name it. Um, in 2013, he was awarded a Guggenheim in poetry. He's also received fellowships from Breadloaf, Stanford Humanities Center in Palo Alto, and his fourth book of poems, Earthly Delights, will appear in September. And he is currently editing a collection of new scholarly articles on loyalty as a virtue for Oxford University Press. Give it up for Troy John Moore. Right. That's really nice. <laughs> really appreciate that. All right. Thank you for that really nice introduction. Um, thank you, everybody who was involved in setting this up. I thank you for keeping them drunk because the, the poetry sounds better that way. <laughs> it's so great. Thank you, Anthony, for reading with me, letting me read with you. That's really, really great. And Heather, thank you for being here. You came a long way. <laughs> we both did. So um, the, the fourth book will appear in September. And since it is September, it has appeared. So here it is. I'm going to read from it. Uh, my first reading from this new book. Um, I've got a few to sell if you're interested, and Anthony's got a few copies of his book too. So stick around afterwards if you're interested. I hate to sound like a capitalist in this place. It's really inappropriate. I'm sorry. Um, I have a few to share, is my, actually what I should have said. So uh, I'm going to start with the first poem in the book. It's called Muse. I, I hope the muse is here tonight. You never know where she's going to be, if she's going to make I know we're at capacity. She might have shown up late. She often does. So maybe she can get in but it's hard to know how to invoke the muse, but I've been working on it. So this is called Muse. Muse, wear like clothing. Fade into my skin as I unfurl for you, like an oyster shell or a work shirt bleached by sunlight. I've hung on the line for so long, here under the moon, to make this dark space inside where a song can suffer and grow. Mouth, mouth, move against me. You will sing, and then you will sing, then you will go. Then I will sing, then I will sing, and then go. This is one called Unearned Seas. You know, poetry readings make people nervous, and so I have a thing to do to set people at ease. I know I can tell you're all very anxious, so let me, um, <laughs> especially in New York, because there's so many other things you could be doing right now. So. <laughs> I know that's really hard. So it's great that you're here. And also, you don't know what the poet's going to read. Like, what will his themes be? What if, you know, people are anxious these days. So I'm just going to read off a quick list of the themes I intend to address tonight. Uh, inspiration, I've already just done that. Death, lots of that. Um, feelings about early morning. Strawberries, comma, their odor. Uh, <laughs> loss. Uh, poems you won't live to write. Again, that's basically death. <laughs> Grocers, daughters, Canadian rock musicians, deceased. <laughs> Uh, silence is a metaphor for death. Okay, you're starting to get the idea, but I, I should probably stop there. Um, that's not going to make you less nervous. So this is Unearned Season. This is a poem about my feelings about early morning. The sun still beneath the horizon, and already a bird at the fur, a bee at the flower, and a mosquito sent, but by whom, to trouble me out of some unrelenting slumber. Another summer, unearned season. Universe's origin for attempts to understand and gearing up as if to regenerate necessary conditions for nightfall. They used to sell oranges in the theater to cover the scent of human bodies, that social neighborly stench, though your own, or if not that, your lover's is perhaps pleasing. Tell me, is anything human alien truly? A sip of whiskey counts as the night before's and so, no harm done, you say to yourself. Necessary conditions of morning, the sun just coming up now, and your brain seized by the odor of strawberries. Sing and take aim. 
to sing and to do, to sing and to sing and take aim and aspire to do for once today, to do no harm. And this is called a poem you will not live to write. We all, all of us who are poets know about this poem that you will not live to write. If you're really wondering what my poems are about, um, to paraphrase the great poet Robert Haas, this isn't quite what he said, but it's close. Uh, all my new poems are about loss. In this, they resemble all my old poems. <laughs> the poem you will not live to write, the poem you would have written, if only you'd had one more month, one more day, one more hour, is a killer. A no-holds-barred, balls-out masterpiece. The one where you put it all together, everything you learned, everything you suffered, all the bits of being human you spent your life gathering up. It's the poem you have been waiting for all your life. The poem you will not live to write. The next poem you would have written after the last poem you will write, which is, it must be said, a perfectly decent, unexceptionable, unexceptional poem. The sort of poem you would have read in some magazine or other had someone else been the author or made it through the first half anyway, and then turned maybe to the theater reviews or the gossip column, or else just put the whole tiresome issue aside, is, let's just admit it, a knockout. There's no avoiding the fact. The poem you will not live to write is the one that would make the grocer's daughter come back to you. It's the poem you'd wear like an, a pair of expensive stolen shoes to a wedding you weren't invited to. It's the one that waits for you in the dark, unseen in the underbrush, just outside the campfire zone of protected light, with nothing but an uninhibited, passionate kiss and your death on its mind. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. The, the standard, the, the norms of applause of poetry readings are really contended, I think. Nobody really, <laughs> so I don't know what we're supposed to do, but thank you. I really appreciate it. Uh, this is a poem about loss for sure. It's an elegy. Uh, there was a, a rock band in Canada, the Tragically Hip. I was a huge fan. I, anybody know them? Didn't I know? The only Canadian. Thank you. I'm glad somebody yes. asked. Yeah. They were wonderful. I got to see them in concert a couple of times. The, uh, the, the front man, the singer Gord Downey, incredible performer, really amazing lyricist. Um, and he died of brain cancer a couple of years ago. So this is an elegy for him, a poem for Gord Downey. You were always there singing from the back of the car as if you were drunk back there dreaming and singing while I drove aimlessly about the outskirts of anybody's hometown, learning where the lovers go after dark and practicing the names that had been rearranged reassigned to the sacrosanct dark spaces that remained underneath the crooked branches of the trees. And you were reconnoitering the impenetrable waters of that vast silent sound, collectively known as the collective Canadian unconscious, like someone searching for a drowned diver or a slipped off wedding ring. A nation will watch me die, you sang from back there. And I believed it the way you believe something that somebody says in their sleep fireworks by the side of the road, northern lights and harbor lights perpetually enticing, perpetually retreating, holding themselves at a constant unbridgeable distance from my ungovernable eyes. I flailed my way to a first kiss as your face published itself on every TV screen and every bar. Last night I dreamed you were in my kitchen or else you are a sled dog on the snowy plain nuzzling the furry neck of Kurt Cobain. <laughs> dancing to Schoenberg, drinking schooner in Lunenburg. And it was really you, wasn't it, who came paddling past, really you whose psalms and sonics sang the stoic poles together. I think now that maybe we were not a nation until we watched you sing and die. Oh, Gord, I, lived, I lift this last round to the sprawling sound of the gravid growlings you brought up from those dark waters and the verses you engraved on the vast white wall of unmusic that we face but cannot force ourselves to face. Listen now, that wail from the West's waste to face margins. <laughs> Listen now, these foreign shores, these fallen final invitations. 
Listen now, this ceaseless silence you have signed and left behind you. Really did have a dream that he was in my kitchen, which was a really interesting, and it really felt, I woke up feeling like I had talked to him. Poetry, some, well, that wasn't poetry, but it led to that poem. And that's when I started writing it. Poems sometimes feel prescient and maybe long after the fact. And I was recently looking at my third book, which came out in 2015, so well before the pandemic. But there's this poem in it and it had these lines that really caught my attention as I was looking through it. So there's this, it's a sort of a fragment poem. And one of the fragments reads this, it says, nothing is weirder than the human face. Or, <laughs> fortunately, we are not permitted to see it very often. The masks and the lighting take care of that. I thought, wow, that's really, but what's really funny is that this poem was called Going Viral. I don't know. So sometimes the poem knows more than you do, I think. And so you get it down and later on you find out what it's really about. That kind of happens a lot. Um, this is a poem, this is a good New York poem because it's about a real New York figure, Andre Gregory, the theater director. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I'm sort of obsessed with the movie My Dinner with Andre, uh, which of course is what's not filmed in New York, but is set in a Manhattan restaurant. And, and there's a wonderful bit in that film where he's talking to Wally and he talks about his ideas as a theater director and how when he was a young theater director, he was putting on a, a production of the Bacchae, I think. It's one of the ancient Greek tragedies. And he really wanted to get a real human head to pass around the audience so that, as, as he says in the movie, that the audience would understand that this was real. <laughs> and, and he was not able to do it, as it turned out, I know. <laughs> but, so this is a, a poem about that called Andre Gregory said. Andre Gregory said that he wanted to put a human head in a play from a corpse, that is to say as a way of making the audience feel that this was real. Lives being lived out and brought to an end on this very stage, which all the worlds, uh, as we know, not merely set and struck to present a passing show, to have us pass it around, fresh death in our hands, to see if we can withstand an art that cleaves so tightly to things as they are. If one can stand another skull so near one's own, one on, one off, one live, one not. One more performance of the plot, if one can withstand its demands, but it's never quite the same one night to the next. So there is no question of owning, but only of being present, or rather of having been, and the having been, having been followed by a quick exit pursued by a fill in the blank. Each actor's pursuer uniquely his, each audience member dismembered in her own manner. Death by silence, death by moonlight, death by monologue. What doesn't kill you kills another. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What doesn't kill you now kills you tomorrow. Takes just that longer. So there's a lot of poems about movies in here. I seem to be obsessed with movies and they eventually formed a kind of sequence. There, there's one long poem that doesn't exactly belong to the sequence, but is, uh, it's called American Beauty and it is about the film American Beauty, but also about a lot of other things, including I think American Beauty, quite literally. Uh, and that's way too long to read. So there's no way I would inflict that on you. Um, and some of the, so there's a sequence also called screenshots and each one of those is dedicated to some particular film. And I thought I would read a couple of those, but the, the couple of the shorter ones. Uh, and probably, I don't know if, if you haven't seen the film, maybe it won't mean anything to you at all. So this might be a good time to take a little break if, if, uh, <laughs> if, if you haven't seen Boogie Nights, but I sort of assume everybody has seen Boogie Nights, right? If you haven't seen Boogie Nights, that's on you. <laughs> that's, that's your, you, you need to correct that because it's really amazing. So this is my two line poem about Boogie Nights. Because it's not the size of the camera, it's how long you can hold the shot. And I know, right? And if you haven't seen it, have your friend who has seen it explain it to you. Um, 
and, and this is one, this is the only one of the screenshots, which is about a film that I have not seen, although I have seen parts of it, but it's a, a movie called Cocksucker Blues, which is about the Rolling Stones when they were quite young. Uh, and uh, well, I'll just read, it had a different title at first and now it's got this title. So now it's called Screenshots Cocksucker Blues. The lyrics first person is haunted by the growl of impending regret. You might sometimes get what you wanted, but you can't always want what you get. <laughs> Thank you. I'll read a couple more. Um, I will uh, read this one called scordatura, which is uh, a lovely Italian word for apparently when you take a musical instrument and you put it slightly out of tune on purpose. Um, and that really, this was a poem that really was written to the title. I found that word and thought that has to be a poem. And so I wrote this poem to that word. Scordatura. Sing the string bent skyward. Sing the string tuned low toward the floor. The cheap black plastic radio tuned to a station defunct for a decade or more. Broadcasting from a secluded spot 800 miles from town. That was your childhood. Straining off balance, leaning forward into the void. <laughs> to hear those isolate patches of meaningful sound, those sonic stragglers struggling to pierce the white noise, the ether screen like dolphins trying to break the surface. The unendorsed word borrowed from Farsi, borrowed from Finnish, borrowed from French, that burrows its way into conversation at the precise point to elicit that illicit smile, that sign of unacknowledged longing, officials can neither confirm nor deny. The, the unidentified substances brought by camel train or container ship from the frayed and time darkened edges of the atlas that's passed for 10,000 nights from hand to antique hand, mixed into the pigments, mixed into the spices, mixed into the blood. The unprogrammed twist of the elbow or ankle thrown into the wrestle or dance at an opportune moment so that your opponent or partner discovers herself surprised and helplessly prone on the floor. The audience finding itself on its feet applauding, awash with sudden astonished wonder. The alien coin slipped into the currency stream to be swapped for an hour of pleasure. The foreign delight slipped into the ceaseless barrage of unsanctioned satisfaction the unimproved road that carries you to the unapproved destination, the intangible sadness of the inscrutable faces of the children whose discordant laments greet you there. And I'll do, now, now see, you realize that because my poems tend to be shorter than Anthony's, you're ending up clapping more and it's sort of unfair. <laughs> I feel like I'm cheating, so I'm sorry, Anthony. Um, I'll do two more fairly short poems. This first one is actually a translation of a poem by Paul Verlaine from 1866, Le Rosignol. And so it translates as The Nightingale. The Nightingale. All of my memories, turbulent birds, wildly flying, collapse and converge on me, shrieking and crying, falling and settling in the yellow foliage where the crooked Alderwood mirror image of my heart floats in the silver violet water of regrets and melancholy floats nearby. Then after they fall, ominous noises appeased by a humid breeze as it rises, expanding bit by bit through the branches, so soothing that before you know, you hear nothing, nothing but the voice that celebrates the absent one, nothing but the voice so languid of the songbird that was so many years ago my first love, and who sings even now like it's the first day of its being and the world. And in the sad splendor of the moon as it rises, pale and solemn, in this tender and melancholy night, sagging with the heaviness of summer and of silence, of things we cannot guess, rocked gently on the azure by the wind's caress, the trembling tree, the nightingale's mournful address. I love the hypnotic tone of that poem. And it, it's very much in the original and I worked really hard to try to capture as much of that as I could. I think it's really special. 
Um, I'm gonna read one more. It's a very New York poem. I felt like I, I, it's been so long since I've gotten to read in New York. It's been a long time since I've even gotten to be in New York. And I know that all of us over the last couple of years have been missing a lot of things that we were used to. And to be in a room full of people reading and enjoying poetry that have all come together for something like this feels, you know, it was always special, but I think I appreciate the specialness of it now in a way more, more than I would have a few years ago. So, so thank you all for being here. It's really, really nice to get to do this. Um, this is a New York poem, it's called Want. It, it's really a love poem and a, a kind of a lust poem too, but largely, largely love. Want, how do I want you? Let me count the ways. I want you on demand. I want you streaming. I want you half asleep and in the taxi dreaming slouched and drifting in the back seat in the June Manhattan haze. I want you streaming. I want you on demand. I want you in the back seats of a hundred thousand taxis. I want you on every platform my device can access. I want you arched and shivering at the snap of my command. I want you opening nationwide this week. I want you dreaming. I hope you catch my meaning, dear. I want you on demand. I want you in the taxi's headlights beaming bright. I want you scheduled for inclusion in my pay per minute plan. I want you in the cab we hailed at twilight's last gleaming. I want you on demand. So let us count the ways I desire you to want me, to want you, to want me, to want you. I want you to understand. I could go on like this for days. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Four times for Troy and Um, beautiful poetry, both of you. Thank you so much for reading tonight. Um, we are here every Monday night uh, through December, and uh, then again, getting in February. As Jason always likes to say, we like it so much better when you are. If anyone's interested in getting on our mailing list. Um, certainly just come talk to us and uh, there's an announcement that goes out every week about the poetry meeting. Um, but if you can't actually be here, we are streaming them now as well. So if you're on that list, you'll be able to get the Zoom link and stuff. And so that's kind of a fun way to get involved too. Um, that's to say what? That's to our Facebook group page. Yes, our Facebook group page. And we also have an Instagram, which is I think at KGB Monday night. That sounds like cool. And um, if you are around, if you're in the city, uh, definitely come by next week. We are having Heidi Seaborn and Matthew Rohrer, uh, two wonderful poets as well. Um, I think that's it for announcements. And uh, let's give it up one more time for, uh, for Troy and for Anthony. Um, oh, Anthony, uh, both also, as he said, have books for sale. Uh, they might even consider signing them for you if you ask real nice. So um, wonderful. All right, see you guys next week. Thank <laughs> you.